Welcome to Brain in a Vat. We are delighted to be joined by Stephen Cave, and we are going to be talking about immortality. Uh, Stephen has just co-authored um, a book on the topic with one of our favorite guests, John Martin Fisher. And the title of the book is Should You Live Forever? A Debate. And Stephen has been described as the immortality curmudgeon. He thinks that living forever wouldn't be so good. So, Stephen, do you want to start the thought experiments and persuade us why we ought to die? Yes. Well, right here in Cambridge, there is a lot of research now going into anti-aging, um, cellular rejuvenation and so on. There's uh, an Autos Labs here. There's, there's one in California, too. Biggest startup in history, $3 billion of investment. Lots of brilliant minds, more resources, more talent, more money going into anti-aging technology than ever before. So suddenly this age old philosophical conundrum of whether we, it would be good to live forever or not might become a practical question. Now, lots of generations have thought that, of course, but uh, I think we have better reason than any previously to be taking the question seriously. And. I suggest that if suddenly there is a breakthrough from Autos Labs or, or one of the others that allows us to live very, very much longer lives, I'm not just talking about an extra few years, an extra few decades, we, we can talk about that later, but, but really a breakthrough that defeats aging, that defeats disease for good. And, you know, policymakers, a government has to make the decision, should we roll this out? Imagine it's as cheap as aspirin. We can roll it out. Anyone could have it. It's a simple pill that you take. I would argue that we shouldn't. Not now, anyway, that the consequences of us all living forever would be catastrophic for our societies and our planet. So it seems like there's two different questions. The one is, should I live forever? Should I, should I want to live forever? And the other is, should we all live forever? Um, and that those are distinct, right? So it could be the case that society collapses if everyone lives forever, but that society is just fine if only I live forever and maybe I have a good life. So is it the case on your view that even if we all shouldn't live forever, maybe any particular person should want to? Often when philosophers before have asked the question, should we choose to live forever? They've meant, would it be good for me as an individual? And so... In the new book, where John and I tried to clarify some of these age-old arguments, I distinguish between what I call prudential arguments for and against living forever, which are questions about whether it would be good for any individual like me or like you, and ethical arguments for whether it would be good. So what would be the broader consequences for society, for the planet, for our species and other species, and so on. But I'm a skeptical on both accounts. Now, I think the arguments uh, for why potentially it would be bad to choose to live forever have been well explored in the philosophical literature. This is, you know, the argument around boredom, for example, um, procrastination, meaninglessness, and so on. And the ethical arguments are more the arguments like overpopulation, social injustice, and so on. So let's focus a little bit on the ethical arguments. Um, we an interview with Lionel Shriver about her book, Should I Stay or Should I Go? And one of the cases that she has in the book is that you have exactly the drug that you've come up with. And the difficulty that society runs into is that you have all these new beings and no one dying. And so you have this population crisis. And uh, someone decides to deal with it quite resoundingly by uh, spreading a virus that causes mass death uh, as a warning. And everyone then realizes, well, it's not viable for us to continue to, to have children. Um, but we don't need to because we're all going to live forever. And so they all volunteer um, to become uh, infertile. Uh, so you can imagine getting hysterectomies or whatever it is that you do. Then you don't run into the population problem. There's an alternative, which is that uh, given that you could have people living forever, that the kinds of information that you hold on to grows and grows and grows. And so maybe human beings don't remain on Earth, that you then say, well, given that there's so many of us, but we have this incredible amount of knowledge that we can share, we start to populate other planets and spread out across the galaxy. Um, and so again, you don't have this resources problem. You might also just become very good at managing your resources. Um, so that may, it may be the case that it's fact contingent as to whether it's good or bad for society, depending on uh, what you do 
the overpopulation, one might not be that bad or two, you could avoid it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think those two scenarios you sketch are really nice for getting us to the premises of the overpopulation argument. Basically, the argument is that if people continue to be born, but no one dies, we will exceed the carrying capacity of the planet. But there are lots of variables there. One is, you know, how long people really are living, you know, whether it's really immortality or just extended lifespan, whether people really are continuing to have children, and what is the carrying capacity of the planet. So just to focus on that last one for a second, of course, the carrying capacity of the planet has shifted enormously over the last few centuries, millennium. You know, if it wasn't for nitrogen fixation, a technology invented, you know, uh, just 100 years ago, we wouldn't be able to support the 8 billion people on the planet we do now because we wouldn't be able to grow enough food. But we can because of this technological advance. So optimists say, you know, if we can crack aging and disease, if we can come up with an elixir, then we can crack all of the associated problems. And so we will be able to sustain a much larger population. And then when people like me come along and, and start worrying in, in our Malthusian way, you know, people point out that Thomas Malthus was saying it would be an overpopulation crisis 200 years ago, and he's consistently been wrong. And, and you know, the, the neo-Malthusian sense have been consistently wrong. But, you know, from my point of view, it's a bit like saying, you know, someone's turned on a bath and they've and they've sort of left the room and, you know, they come back after 10 minutes and it's only half full. I mean, oh, no, it's not going to overfill, overflow. Look, it's fine. There's loads of space. But of course, you know, what's happened in the past is they're a very bad guide to what will happen in the future. Just because a bath hasn't overflown yet doesn't mean it won't. Clearly, there is a limit to how much water can be in the bath. And just because we haven't yet reached the carrying capacity of the planet doesn't mean there isn't one or doesn't mean we won't reach one. And of course, some people think we already have reached it. It's just taking a little while for the effects of that to play out. You know, plenty of people think that we are living through an ecological crisis because there are too many of us living unsustainably and, and, and so on. Interestingly, when experts are asked what they think the carrying capacity of the planet is, they tend to answer around 8 to 10 billion, which is our current population, which would be vastly exceeded if we discovered life extension technology tomorrow. Just so to add on this. Um, the current panic is not overpopulation, but underpopulation. So the projections are that most societies around the world are not repopulating um, at replacement level, being 2.1. Um, Africa being the exception, but America, China, India, Europe, Australia, America, all under. Japan being an extreme case, I think sitting about 1.3. And so the view is that we will kind of crest up to about 10 billion and then quite rapidly crash down to about 2. And the reason why this is seen as a crisis is that you've had so much technological development because you've had um, so much population growth that your chances of hitting a genius go up um, when you're producing so many people. And so people are now doom-mongering about this. I mean, what's nice, of course, is it, it cancels out the doom-mongers on the climate change side because we don't have enough people to cause all the climate change. So we'll see which doom-monger wins. Um, but it might very well be the case that if people become immortal, that you just would slow down how many kids you have um, as people urbanize, as you become wealthier. You know, you also would avoid a lot of the problems. Uh, if you could live forever and avoid disease, well, you know, that seems like your quality of life would go up quite dramatically as well. Um, and a lot of the reasons why people have children are so that they would look after them in their old age and that reason would fall away. Um, so it seems like one ought not to be overly pessimistic on that front. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, um, why would we be constrained to planet Earth? Um, you know, we've already got Musk sort of saying, let's go to Mars. If we really did run out of space, it seems like, uh, you know, the immortals who've been around for 500 years would have accumulated an enormous amount of information and would have some good thoughts on how to get off planet. So to take the first one about um, fertility levels dropping, there is lots of evidence that, uh, that as societies become wealthier, the fertility levels drop for many reasons. Infant mortality is lower. You don't need to have lots of children in the hope one or two survive. Women have more opportunities than they're not just stay at home mothers and so on. And as you say, in many societies, this is considered now a crisis because it's fallen below replacement level. So some optimists say that if we were to become immortal, then as you were suggesting earlier, we might forego having children altogether. And that would, of course, solve any kind of overpopulation crisis. Um, but firstly, I don't think everyone would want to forego having children. There are lots of people who 
do consider having children to be an important part of a meaningful life. Um, in surveys about what makes life meaningful, having family tends to come out top still. And, you know, I consider having children to be an important part of my life. And, and, well, of course, at the same time, respecting that lots of other people might see it differently. And if people are literally living forever, then any amount of children will cause a significant increase in population. But um, in a scenario where people are living longer, but having fewer children, fewer than replacement level, then interestingly, what we would get is both crises, one after the other. So initially, there would be a population boom because more generations are alive at any one time. Each generation would be slightly smaller if um, fertility levels are below replacement level, but it would still be you know, hundreds of millions of people. And if people are living to 150, that doubles the number of generations alive at one time. So there'd be a huge population boom that could double or triple human population. But then as people did start to die, as they reached whatever the new uh, life expectancy was, 160 or whatever, um, then slowly because of the lower population, uh, lower fertility level, populations would start to dwindle. So it's, you know, it's worth worrying about both crises, but potentially life extension could cause both just one after the other. I grew up reading this wonderful comic, 2001 AD, back in the days when 2001 was unimaginably far in the future. And it was all about us settling space and settling the moon and so on. And, and I grew up thinking it was inevitable. And uh, when it happened, it would be just fine. And now, of course, people are putting large sums of money into it. Um, you know, people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, who have a lot of resources, a lot of talent at their disposal. But I do think it's a fantasy, at least for anything like the foreseeable future. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that the kind of, you know, the science fiction we've grown up with, whether it's in comics or films, etc., it shows living in space as being fairly normal. But of course, it isn't. It's an incredibly harsh environment. It's hard to convey just how harsh an environment it is. It's so Mars is so much less fit for humans than anywhere on Earth, you know, in, in, in terms of temperature, in terms of ultraviolet, in terms of not having you know, the kind of stuff of life, water and oxygen and, and, and so on. And not to mention just how far away it is from, from where all those resources are available here, here on Earth. So if people were to say, you know, our solution to overpopulation is we're going to build giant castles on top of Mount Everest and then a load more in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. We think, well, you're mad. But either of those are vastly, vastly more realizable than populating Mars. So I don't think it's a very good plan B. I certainly don't think it's the kind of plan B where we can think, oh, it's fine. We don't have to worry about overpopulation and there's always Mars. That would be a mistake. Suppose you held in your hand the pole that would allow people to live a lot longer in your right hand and you could distribute it to the population or you could throw it in the bin and no one would find out about it. So you've paid for all the research and you could throw it in the bin, destroy all the research and no one would know. You think that's the right thing to do. Now, suppose <laughs> in your left hand, you, 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 you hold a different pull. And what this pull does is it shortens everyone's lives by 20%. Surely you think that if it's right to throw away the life lengthening pull, it's also the right thing to distribute without people's knowledge, the life shortening pull, because that, if you think that society will be a better place in the absence of long living people, you also think society will be a better place with people who live a little shorter for the very same reasons. But surely it's unethical to distribute the pull that would shorten everyone's lives. And so why isn't it also wrong to not distribute the pull that lengthens everyone's lives? Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, a lovely question. Now, the arguments for and against life extension, I don't think any of them are um, you know, true for all time, and uh, regardless of the facts of the matter. I don't think it's inevitable that all humans will get bored after a certain number of years. Uh, it's not inevitable that social justice um, will be worsened by some people living longer. All of these claims are, I think, contingent. And that means there are variables. There are things we can do. There are, there are policies, there are you know, social structures, or, uh, there are ways of life that make it more or less plausible for people to live longer lives. 
you know, right now, uh, as, as I said, there are many people who think we've reached the carrying capacity of the planet, but we, we can change that by choosing to live more sustainably. In that case, we'll be able to sustain more humans. Um, you know, v with regard to boredom and ennui that comes from, you know, living longer, there are hundreds of millions of people on Earth right now who, who are clinically depressed, like who, who really are fed up, um, who don't want to live long, who don't want to live further at all, let, let alone vastly longer. Well, there might be things we can do about that, psychiatric and medical uh, in interventions, social interventions and so on. So I don't think any of these facts are established. I don't think any of the arguments for, at the moment, ringing the alarm bell about the possibility of a radical life extension um, breakthrough are arguments for shortening lives. I think they're arguments for thinking carefully about the kind of society we want to create and what we can do to allow for the possibility of longer, happier lives. It sounds like you want to bake your cake and eat it too then, right? So you, you want to say, well, the reasons why you shouldn't shorten people's lives are not good enough reasons, but those reasons are good enough reasons not to lengthen everyone's lives. And that, that seems odd to me. It seems like you're dealing in the same currency in both cases, which is life term. That's years mm -hmm. of life. Yeah. But, um, I think it's important to start separating out, which John and I do in the book, which arguments for and against extending lives apply to which versions of living longer. So a lot of the debate in the philosophical literature has been about things like the inevitability of boredom and meaninglessness and so on. Now, I think if we are living forever, I literally forever, if we are immortal, if we are not the kind of things that can die, then I think those arguments have a lot of traction. And you might think, well, that's not what we're talking about. People, no one thinks that's realistic. But actually, you know, billions of people on Earth and probably the majority of people in human history have believed something like that. You know, anyone who thinks that we have a soul, that it goes on to an afterlife, might think not only that we survived death, but we're in, intrinsically not the kind of thing that can die, that we are an immaterial, incorruptible soul substance. And so they are faced with the prospect of eternity. And uh, it's interesting that, you know, John, whose job it is in this book to defend living forever, concedes that that would be terrible, even though it is something that billions of people already believe. And it would be terrible because um, the risk of an eternity of suffering or billions of years of suffering is simply too high. But so what we're talking about is, um, you know, the possibility of life extension well, at the other end of the spectrum. There's a possibility of extending life by a few years, say, you know, and then, of course, that's a huge spectrum with much in between. And I think when we're talking about extending life by a few years or a few decades, then those arguments don't apply, or at least they don't apply inevitably. Certainly, I think there are things we can do to address them. And that is equally true of arguments around overpopulation and social injustice, which would, I think, bite very early with life extension, you know, even if it was just a decade or, or two, but that doesn't mean to say we can't do anything about it. So if you're concerned with social justice, um, and I assume you kind of want, uh, I don't know, an egalitarian utopia um, where everyone has similar amounts of stuff, then can't we just hand out the life enhancing drugs to all the poor fuckers out there? Um, so they get to surpass disease, they get to live on longer, that um, their wealth isn't, you know, divided by all these generations of kids that they have. Um, you know, the rich slowly die off and we get to your social justice paradise. Um, we don't give it to the rich, of course. You know. Well, um, I hadn't considered exactly that scenario before, but um, I, mean, I think the, the risk of life extension exacerbating social injustice is, of course, greatest if it's only available to the rich, which is, of course, entirely realistic. I mean, if there are major breakthroughs in life extension technology, there's no reason to think that they will be available like aspirin. It's much more likely that there'll be you know, a whole series of, of, of invasive and elaborate and extremely expensive interventions, at least in the early days. And so they will be available only to the rich. And then we, we will uh, very likely have people holding on to power, you know, Vladimir Putin has been in power for over 20 years, prime minister or president of Russia, been able to accumulate um, uh, vast amounts of um, power in that time in order to perpetuate his position. 
or of course the rich equally that's how capitalism works the more you acquire the more wealth it generates uh, and so on um and not only that but as a rule we tend to think that differentials in um life expectancy are themselves unjust not only because you can use them to acquire more power and wealth but because time is itself a good i mean at least you know in the uk where i live every now and again it's reported that people in the north don't live as long as people in the south you know the rich live longer than the poor and so on always with a sense of injustice that this gap of say 10 years isn't acceptable something must be done you know government has policies to address this and make it equal and that's just a, a gap which is a just a fraction of our current lifespan so imagine if instead the better off were living 100 years longer and so on i don't think we would find that uh, acceptable so if I understand correctly, there's two reasons we've discussed so far for why it would be unethical for you to distribute the pool. The one would be overpopulation threats, um, and the other one would be uh, widening inequality um, in society. If you were to put both of those issues aside, so if Mark's solutions work, um, should we then distribute the pool? Well... I think if the ethical problems are wholly solvable and we are then left only with the prudential questions of whether it would be good for you know me or you as individuals, then I think it becomes much more a matter of personal choice. Certainly, I wouldn't feel very comfortable saying to someone, no, I'm going to deprive you of these extra years because I think probably you'll get bored. That doesn't, that, I don't think that would be in keep. We don't do that with medical treatment right now probably even if there was very strong evidence that someone was prone to severe boredom, we, we wouldn't deny them, you know, medical interventions that could add to their lives. So I think as a society, we'd have to think very carefully about what we want, how we structure our society to support happy, longer lives. But I wouldn't be comfortable imposing it or a decision on people. So then let's imagine this is a drug not distributed by the super state. Um, but just sold like Panado is sold. Um, so in other words, it's marketplace, it's cheap, everyone's allowed to buy it. You take the view that there's nothing wrong with individually purchasing it, that it would be wrong to deprive someone of buying it because it's a personal choice. And let's say everyone buys it. And it has this bad byproduct, which you say is the overpopulation. Um, so you've had a bad effect, but no individual has done anything wrong. They were all had a right to do it. Um, so do you object? Well, you know, I, I I spent ten years working in government as well as sort of uh, as in, in between philosophizing, and so my um, I think there are too many ums and ahs in this bit, so I'm just going to start again. <laughs> that, that 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 little bit. Um, so it's a good question, but uh, so I also spent ten years working in government in between philosophizing. So I also think in policy terms as well as the more abstract questions of right or wrong that ethics deals with. So I'm not always asking myself, do I object or not? Is it is it good or bad? But rather, what can we do about it? What can we do to make it good? What can we do to make this go well? What have it, you know, and, and, and what, how bad would be the prospects for society of it going badly? And how do we weigh those against other social goods and, 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 and so on? So obviously overpopulation leading to societal collapse, uh, you know, the collapse of ecosystems and um, you know, our uh, uh, agricultural systems, mass migration, civil wars, global wars, all of these things, all of which were the stuff of history, right? I mean, all of this stuff has been absolute staples of history. I believe those those would be very, very bad. And avoiding those would warrant, you know, some, some fairly strong uh, interventions. But equally, we don't have to sit around and wait for them to happen. I think there are things we can do to make the possibility of life extension go well. So, you know, and, and these are things which, which, you know, maybe philosophers don't often talk about around sort of pension policy, you know, and, and lifelong education and, and career structures, uh, combating ageism and, and, and so on, all of which will um, address some of my curmudgeonliness and I think increase the chances of this going well. Okay, so the big pink elephant in the room is the boredom stuff, which I know is, is maybe over discussed in the literature, but I'd like to take a stab at it, if that's all right. Um, so, so basically, why is it necessarily the case that an infinite life will be bored? Um, one possible solution is the loss of memories over time, which could happen either by design, which you purposely do. So you 
scrub certain memories over time so that you can re-experience certain things without boredom. Um, or it could just be the case that there's a natural attrition of memory over a very long lifetime. Very old people often experience this. Uh, I'm told I'm not very old, but I'm definitely forgetting things already. Um, so I imagine if you're in your 900s, uh, you're definitely forgetting more. Um, and, and maybe that's enough to, uh, to waylay boredom. And then also just your changing environment. Um, the environment around you is not static. New books get written, new movies get made. There's new experiences available all the time. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with much of that. I think we need to recast the boredom problem. It's often presented as, well, lots of nice experiences lose their color um, if you have experienced them too much. You know, I love Thai green curry. If I had every day, I wouldn't. Um, you know, I love going to a concert of whatever kind. If I did it every day, I wouldn't and so on. And so the argument runs that all these pleasurable experiences uh, cease to become pleasurable if repeated often enough. And if you live long enough, you would repeat them often enough. Therefore, boredom is inevitable. But I don't think that does capture what's really at stake. I think that's that might be true of boredom as we usually imagine it in the sense of, oh, you know, I'm bored of eating the same breakfast cereal every morning, you know, time for a change. I think what the literature ought to focus on is something deeper. Um, yeah, interestingly, you know, the Macropolis case, this um, play written by uh, Carol Chapek is often discussed and including by, you know, the great philosopher Bernard Williams, who, who, who John in the book refers to as the chairman of the board, which I rather like. Um, but, uh, you know, in that play, which is about an opera singer who's lived for 300 years and has become bored, uh, well, well, become tired of life, I should say. She says, it isn't boredom. You people, you don't understand. You don't have a word for it. It's not boredom. And I think maybe we do have a word for it in English. It's an old fashioned word, ennui, which we borrowed from the French. Melancholy might be a better term or depression might be a better term. I, mean, I mentioned earlier that there are you know, hundreds of millions of people right now who are clinically depressed, who are fed up with life. And I think that's better, a better description because you know, if we really could uh, solve aging and disease, then surely we'd have entertainment sophisticated enough to you know, distract people. I mean, we already have an incredibly sophisticated billion, 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 billion dollar entertainment industry that's really very good at its job. So surely we can have these incredible pleasure domes, which no one could resist being excited by. But what we're talking about isn't whether you're excited by the newest innovation in the pleasure dome. It's how you feel about, oh, am I going to the pleasure dome again? Really? Do I have to put on my socks? I can't be bothered. You know, and get on the metro. Like, why? What's it all about, really? You know, just that, that sense of pointlessness that underlies, I think, um, yeah, it goes much deeper than boredom. So it's not obvious to me that, let's say we're talking about true immortality. So you could live forever, but we're going to be able to create an infinite number of wonderful experiences. Um, and you can already see something like that with AI art, for example. You can produce an infinite number of artworks that are going to be different from each other already. Um, so you can imagine that the pleasure domes, there are infinite amounts of them, they run concurrently. Uh, if you're the kind of person who's already subject to some sense of ennui and we think, well, that's bad and life might be pointless as it is, um, it's not clear that there's an ultimate purpose to your existence. Um, well, it's not clear that the immortality is doing anything on it. So maybe you have more ennui in an infinite life than you would in a finite life, but it just is a feature of life. And if ennui is so bad that we think um, you ought to not have a life, well, then you've got to might you have to buy some other bullets. Like when you start to experience on we to a certain point, you should just kill yourself. Uh, or you take an antinatalist line, which is people ought not to be born. Um, or you take the view it's tolerable um, and it would be tolerable if you were there for eternity. I suppose it also makes a difference whether you can opt out of your life. So whether you could hit a pause button. So to say, look, I, I, I am a bit overwhelmed by this uh, looking at the future forever. And so I'd like to be cryogenically frozen for 100 years and see how I feel when I get out. Uh, maybe things will be nicer then. Uh, or that I could just take an exit pill um, and I can say, you know what, I've lived 6,000 years. I'm happy with that. I now want to die as opposed to I'm forced to be here for an eternity. And as you say, there's the risk that the future eternity looks terrible uh, and that it's an eternity of hellfire. Um, so that would make a difference. It's clear when people discuss the prospect of living forever, whether they would take an elixir or not, the possibility of some kind of exit clause makes a big difference to them. 
I think a lot of people would feel much safer swigging the elixir if they knew that, you know, there, there was another elixir they could swig that would undo it. But I think this is a bit underexplored. It's sort of assumed that, um, that you know, that would make the choice to swig the elixir more rational. And it, because at some point it might be rational and prudential uh, to, 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 you know, swig the poison. But let's think about, at the moment, the kind of ethics of suicide. Um, suicide is, of course, hugely controversial at the moment. It's it's not legal in in, in many countries. It's only legal in a, a few um, uh, a few countries and, and a few U.S. states. Um, lots of people think it's intrinsically immoral for various reasons. You know, they they believe God created life and it's sacred, or or intrinsically irrational because they think you know everyone has a will to live, and if they temporarily want to kill themselves, they must be mentally ill in some way. So these are very widespread beliefs. But of course, some people do believe suicide can be rational. When do they believe it can be rational? Well, at the moment, you, you, it's usually some version of only when suffering is unbearable and incurable. If someone came to you, you know, about you know, a good friend, a spouse, child of yours and said, look, I'm really bored, so I'm going to kill myself now. You, you, you know, of course, you'd, you'd, you'd think that was wrong. You'd think that was the, the wrong decision to make. And you'd try to persuade them um, not to do that. Well, OK, you know, life is short. Life is precious right now. What if life could go on for thousands of years? And after they've been alive for a thousand years or so, um, they said to you, you know, I'm bored, so I'm just going to top myself. I mean, if this, you know, you'd still, I would imagine, try to persuade them not to. You, 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 boredom isn't usually an acceptable reason for suicide. And we know that these things usually pass. So how long do we wait for it to pass? You know, I think is it, is it, um, Marvin, the paranoid android in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who says, oh, the first 10 million years were the worst. So like, how long do we have to wait before to get over it? Like at what point, what, what I'm saying is that I think it's, much less obvious that actually taking the the poison, the anti elixir, at any point would be a rational decision, and it's usually people on the other side of the argument. People like you know John Martin Fisher in the book who were saying, "Yeah, sure, sometimes we'll get bored, but it will pass." Well, well, how long do we wait? And 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 if we have to wait for it to pass, because that's what usually happens, then it never becomes, but it's never rational to take the take the anti elixir. So I, I'm wondering about um, sort of a sort of a sororities problem here, which is if you think that it's good when you have cancer to take a drug that prolongs your life for five years, um, that you should take it. And if you found a better drug that prolonged your life for 10 years, you should take it. And now we get rid of the cancer and just say, well, I can just extend your lifespan by five years or 10 years, and then it becomes 20 years. Um, it seems like if you should prolong your life a little bit, you should prolong your life a little bit more and a little bit more than that and a little bit more than that. And it's unclear to me where you would draw a line in, in that argument for why you shouldn't prolong your life a little bit further indefinitely. Hmm. It, it is very hard to draw a line, other things being equal, but then not. And, and part of what I'm arguing for really is a kind of empirical turn in this debate. You know, for, for so long in the philosophical literature, it's been had in the abstract, but it isn't abstract. You know, it's about, well, but, you know, but perhaps with certain conceptions of the afterlife, it might be. But really, when we're talking about life extension interventions, we're talking about, you know, real humans living on, on, on this earth with the social structures that we have and the economic structures and so on. And I think there, then, then there are real consequences of saying five years or 10 years or 20 years or 50 years. You know, it matters. You know, well, I could extend my life by 50 years, but I haven't saved up enough. Like my pension is not good enough, you know, so, or, or, or you know, if it's a government policy decision, maybe we could extend everyone's life for 50 years, but, but you know, then society would collapse for X, Y, Z reasons to do with whatever it is, finances or, or, or um, sustainability or, or what have you. So I think, you know, only in the abstract does it seem like there's a kind of sororities um, puzzle. In real life, when it comes to making policies about these questions, as we might soon have to do, then we're going to have to weigh the potential consequences. But again, you know, an argument not for treating things as if they were static. You know, we can do things to make the possibility of happy 
longer lives more likely. So it could be that the problem isn't the immortality. It's the uh, central planning. You know, the idea that you've got this immortality czar um, just strikes me as one of the most dystopian things I can imagine, where the government gets to decide who gets a life extension, who doesn't. You know, and, you know, well, we kind of agreed as a society that everyone gets to retire at 62 and the people will start rioting if we change it to 64. So because of all our other central planning, I guess no one gets to be immortal. Um, maybe the problem is the central planning, not the immortality. Uh, if you change the nature of people as such and you gave them the freedom um, to make decisions for their own lives, um, well, it might turn out quite well. Um, it's the idea that the central planner says, well, I can't do all the computing, so I guess this is a terrible idea. The problem is the central planning. Well, I think there are scenarios which would be would involve terrible central planning. You know, I mean, we talked about some of them with regard to overpopulation. You know, uh, if society decided, okay, everyone can live as long as they want, but to avoid overpopulation, no one's going to have children. Well, lots of people who pursue life extension think that's entirely reasonable. But then, you know, what are we talking about? Forced sterilization, forced abortion, mass infanticide. I mean, this clearly would be central planning gone mad. Um, or equally, if we said, OK, um, you know, we have the technology to control lifespans now. So in order to give every generation a fair shot while avoiding overpopulation, everyone's going to live to 100. Well, you know, this is the stuff of science fiction dystopias where, of course, you know, the, 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 the 99-year-old full of life, um, you know, runs away, doesn't want to be killed, and the state is involved effectively in mass generational cleansing. The, the, these are dystopias. The, there's no, you know, we, we don't want the state to be intervening in our lives uh, in, in anything like these ways. And the more we have control over life and death through the invention of these technologies, the harder it is for the state not to be involved in, in these kinds of um, decisions because we have to think about the consequences. Um, but I would much rather the state wasn't. So uh, 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 the question is, what can we do now to prepare for you know, better, longer lives? And there are lots of subtle ways. And, you know, we're, uh, you know life... Oh, no, I'm going to stop there. I'm rambling. <laughs> Just going to shut up for a minute. <laughs> so I do have a different question, which is, what would count as living forever? So you've alluded to the idea that people hold a religious belief that you could have an afterlife and you could be immortal and you could be either you go to heaven or you go to hell or you get reincarnated. Um, and I wonder what would count as surviving your death. So for example, with reincarnation, we can imagine a situation where you have a full recollection of your prior life. Um, and so we see that there's a continuous strand between you and the one body and you and the next body. Or we could have one where you have limited knowledge of your prior life or no knowledge at all, but something immaterial like your soul carried through. And it's not clear to me in that last case that you survived because what's the eunice? Um, similarly, you could have other cases where Jason alluded to the idea of losing memories and that might be a way to deal with boredom. There's a graphic novel called After Death where a group of people have worked out uh, how to be immortal. Their bodies will survive forever. Um, but their memories can only uh, last the last hundred years. So they sort of move forward in time. And so you slowly lose memories. And you might think that what's happening is that you've got a series of different beings uh, who exist, who share the same body uh, and overlapping arcs, but that there are deaths in between. And so I wonder what you think it would be to be immortal. Hmm. So I don't subscribe to what's sometimes called a psychological continuity approach to personal identity or what it means to be a person through time. So um, I don't think what makes me the same as that, you know, crying baby in Cornwall in you know, 1973 was a continuity of psychology. I think it's the continuity of a certain organism, uh, a certain, you know, particular in human animal. Um, so for me, when I'm talking about immortality, when I'm talking uh, when I'm envisaging real survival, then I'm talking about survival of this particular animal, and therefore, you know, biomedical interventions are required. But also, if you're talking about the survival of a particular animal, then real immortality, in the sense of never dying, is impossible. Um, you know, if we cure aging and disease, nonetheless, the, the odds are eventually, given enough time, a piano will fall on my head, or you know, a comet will strike. You know, not to mention at some point the sun will consume the earth and so on. 
So if you take the approach to personal identity that I do, that real immortality isn't possible. But I still think it's interesting to think about immortality given other possible you know, theories of what it is to survive as a human. You mentioned psychological continuity. That opens up possibilities of mind uploading and transferring your bodies to robots on Mars and, and, and all sorts of fun things. And of course, what we, we mentioned before, the most people on the planet believe, which is that we're actually a soul and we will you know, effortlessly survive of the death of our bodies. So I think it's in the Bhagavad Gita describes the soul you know, take, taking off and putting on bodies like, like we do clothes. So let's chat about consciousness uploading. So when you die, your consciousness gets uploaded to the web, um, to the cloud, and you persist. There's no overpopulation problem, so long as there's enough hard drives, and one hard drive could house, say, millions of people. Um, so there's no over overpopulation problem. Um, it doesn't seem like there'd be an, a boredom problem because you could just scrub that out of the software. So you could just locate it in, uh, in the code and just make sure that no one who's been uploaded experiences that. What's wrong with that? Hmm. Yeah. Now, I think this, this is a truly dystopian idea, I think, because, I mean, you know, philosophers like to imagine this going smoothly and you know, preserving the person and, and, you know, being utopian, sustainable, pleasant and, and so on. But there are so many ways it can go badly wrong. I mean, firstly, just thinking of the physical substrate, you know, the, the kind of um, data storage required almost certainly would be unsustainable with anything, anything like current technology. I, okay, I admit this is probably a solvable problem eventually. But it's very interesting, this idea of an earth covered in massive data centers, maintained by a few, you know, actual human animals who, who were left around to sort of, you know, twiddle the knobs. Um, and, and you have to ask, like, why would they, why would they do that? You know, why, why would they, why would they divert all of the earth's resources to keeping these sort of ancient beings going in their sort of imaginary um, utopia? But even if even if they chose to, even if they did carry on twiddling the knobs um, indefinitely, generations of janitors for these giant data centers, then I think you know the scope for things that could go very badly wrong, in terms of creating new visions of hell, um, of uh, up, you know uploading being partial and going wrong and so on, this is this is something that I think science fiction writers explore much better than philosophers in in, in much more nuanced ways. Um, you know, Neil Stevenson's um, Dodge stories uh, are good on this and, um, and, and, and many others. But even if that was the case, that things could go wrong. Um, I mean, let's put, a, let's put aside the data storage problem because my hard drive keeps getting bigger every year. Um, I can buy a computer with a bigger hard drive. So I, I assume there'll be some sort of exponential leap um, in data storage. So let's put aside the data storage problem. Well, you could just uh, house everyone uh, on an asteroid somewhere, so it doesn't have to be on Earth. Um, so let's put aside the data storage problem. The, the questions of, you know, a particular person's consciousness upload going wrong, well, that seems no different to a particular birth happening and someone gets harmed in the birth process. That happens all the time. It doesn't seem like it's a unique problem to, to the consciousness upload process. You know, the human animals are subject to lots of, lots of uh, contingent uh, disasters in their lives. You know, they lose limbs, they get hit by buses, you know. Um, if, if, if things are going wrong for those in the upload, it seems like these are similar sort of problems. Um, nevertheless, we think that we want to continue living, even if it's, there's a chance that we'll get hit by a bus tomorrow. And it seems like, therefore, nevertheless, we should want to get uploaded to the cloud, even if there's the chance of a, of a mishap. Hmm. Well, I, I don't think this is personal survival. As I said, I think you and I are animals and no animal is uploaded. I, consciousness isn't uploaded, really. What we're talking about is, you know, taking a computer, an AI, and remodeling it so it has a psychology like yours. Um, we could create a thousand such things. We could create a thousand such wins. Each one tweaked to be slightly different or to be you at different times and so on. Um, maybe someone's already done it. Maybe you're sitting here now. Jason, but actually on Mars, millions of digital Jasons have been created. I mean, does, does this feel like survival for you? You wouldn't even know, right? So, so I, I don't, I don't really think it, um, any individual is surviving through this, and uh, I don't think at the moment that any kind of avatar created, modeled on your psychology, has consciousness. 
But it may well be that computer consciousness can be created. So then we perhaps have a slightly different set of questions around, you know, whether we're obliged to create, you know, happy computer avatars or not. So it might parallel some of the questions Derek Parfit put around, you know, are we obliged to create lots of happy people and, and so on? Those are interesting questions, but I don't think they're questions about immortality. So I'm interested in your account of what constitutes personal identity and if it's the animal account. Um, so one is assume that you got bonked on the head quite badly and you lost all of your memories um, and everyone that was currently in your life you disassociated from and you led a totally different life. Um, or you go into a vegetative state but your body pumps away um, for a while. Um, I'd be inclined to think that you died in both of those cases. I also wonder about, let's say you augmented yourself. So let's say you say, well, I can't augment myself with non-human things. So if I could keep surviving by replacing an arm with a mechanical arm and eventually I became too much of a robot, well, then at some point in the thesis of ship thing, I've died. What if we were just swapping out organs? So there are other human beings' organs. Um, you know, and we do it in the same sort of process that keeps you alive. At what point do you cease to be the same human animal, even if all your thoughts and emotions remain the same? Um, yeah, so I wonder if it's a plausible account of what, what persists. Given also your cells just do change all the time, right? Every seven years, your cells swap out. Um, so you yeah. aren't the same crying baby as you were in 1973, right? In terms of that animal. Um, well, the an account, the, the theory of personal identity theory, sometimes known as, oh, let me do that again. The theory of personal identity, sometimes known as animalism, is not the same as what in the old days was called the bodily account, which I think did have the kind of ship of Theseus problem. Like I, I might not have a single atom uh, composing me now that I had as a baby in 1973. I, maybe I do, maybe I don't, but, it, but let's assume that I don't. Um, for a, a, a sort of old fashioned bodily account, that seems to be a problem. But uh, thinking of humans as organisms, um, uh, means thinking of them more as a kind of process and you know the processes of life have continued and the process of, of life of course require the constant exchange of molecules in, in all sorts of ways so i think a sort of more modern theory of um you know the animalist theory avoids that problem but you are i think when where we get into confusion with personal identity is where we try to get the concept to do too much so mark you asked you know um would i have died if I'm in a vegetative state, will I have died if I've lost all my memories? I think, well, you know, no, as an animal from a biological point of view. But I think, you know, what you're saying is that it's a, you might as well have died. Like you've lost everything that matters. And I think I think Derek Parfit did a great service for the debate when he said, no, let's not just think about identity. Let's think about what matters it when we talk about identity. Now, I think he got to the wrong answers. But I think in asking that question, he was very much asking the right question. And we might say, well, what matters to me actually is my memories, is my personal relationships. You know, if, if I lost all of that, I might as well have died. It doesn't matter to me if I'm the same organism or not. Or someone else might say, like, what matters to me is continuing as this sort of experiencing being. And I don't really care about my personal relationships or memories. I'm just going to sort of sit and meditate and let my thoughts come and go. And as a, as, as a sort of experiencing being, um, I think you would survive, you know, extreme amnesia because you know, as an experiencing being, it's based on a sort of particular nervous system as part of a particular animal, but it's continuing and so on. So I think it's, a, you know, to, we, what we really need to do is pull apart the different things that matter to us when we're thinking about living on. I just want to return to the idea of ennui. Um, it does seem like a bad thing. But is it so bad that it outweighs every other good thing? So yes, it's bad if I'm bored in that sort of deep existential sense, but I can eat another really good chocolate um, because I'm still alive and have good sex and read a great novel and compose music and um, watch uh, season 6,500 of Grey's Anatomy and you know do, do whatever whatever I haven't done before. Surely it's the case that those factors uh, at least balance out the ennui. They might for some people. I think that's the problem with the philosophical arguments around boredom is, is that 
uh, we, we, we pretend we're arguing about something abstract and unchanging. And of course, we're not. We're arguing about people who are different, uh, different psychologies and exist in different circumstances and so on. I, I was reading in the papers the other day about some farmer in Wales who had never left his valley. That was the point of the piece. That I found this man who had never left his Welsh valley. And uh, he, he, he deeply loved his life. He had no desire to go to the next valley. He had no desire to have the, something different to breakfast to what he'd always had. And presumably this person, having existed so long, so perfectly happily with exactly the same routine every day for 70 years, could do so indefinitely, for all I know. Um, it wouldn't keep me happy. Um, well, I think, the, the, therefore, the, a deeper worry is, than boredom or ennui is, is meaninglessness, which is captured not by the Macropolis case, which is often discussed in literature about the bored opera singer, um, but in um, Jorge Luis Borges's short story, The Immortal, which is really very short, only sort of 14 or 15 pages, depending on which version you read. But I think it's an incredibly rich account of a very long-lived life. And there, you know, it's about, I mean, it was Roman centurion, he, he, he stumbles across, um, uh, he, he calls them troglodytes, people who live in these shallow pits and don't move for decades. One had, moved, uh, had been lying still for so long a bird had nested on his chest. And, you know, they, they, don't, they don't care for themselves in any way, they just sort of stare at the sky watching the stars revolve. And then the story comes out as um, the main character gets to know these troglodytes. That at first, when they discovered immortality, they built this fabulous city and then they got bored of it. So they built the parody of this city, which is sort of madness, like stairs hanging from the ceiling and grand doors that just sort of open into a shallow pool and uh, dank water. And you just kind of, they ridiculed themselves and their own hopes. And then even that ceased to be entertaining and they retreated outside. The walls of the city and just now just sort of lie in these shadow pits and and the the reason for this is because having engaged in everything the world has to offer it's all kind of collapsed into one they've lost any sense of identity because they've all done everything so they're all kind of the same they're not distinct anymore they've all done all kind of good deeds but also all perverse deeds they've all been heroes they've all fought for causes and they've lived long enough for these causes to start to contradict themselves you know like Imagine if we'd lived through the last 500 years we, and, and always tried to do the right thing. At some point, we'd have been burning witches. And then at some later point, we'd have been fighting for women's emancipation. You know, we, we'd have been colonizing other countries and then, you know, become sort of, uh, you know, anti-racist crusaders. And, and, and there's only so long you can do all of this, all of this stuff of life before it just becomes too much. And, and all possibility of like project and purpose and meaning collapses and all that remains is to in a shadow pit staring at the stars. So if we think about the nature of the Greek and the Norse gods, as you say, you've got these beings who are um, beings with different moral senses to us, um, that the kinds of things that entertain them, the kinds of obligations they have seem different to being immortal. And I wonder if it's more forgivable that uh, if you do live forever, that uh, tormenting your other immortals, you know, um, locking them up for thousands of years, doing all that sort of stuff. Well, the morality of it seems different. It's sort of really any particular amount of pain you put someone through is just a speck in the ocean, right? And what you might come to enjoy, as you say, is just the diversity of experience, that you'd have a chase for the new, um, whether it's you know disgusting or wrong or pleasurable or exciting, wouldn't really matter, just that it's novel. That would be the thing to chase. I like that thought. I, I think there is a sense in which... These pantheons show us gods who are sort of beyond good and evil. You know, the, 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 the good and evil is a, if it, these are moral constructs are about structuring an orderly society. And that requires, you know, stages of life and sort of progression from life to death. And you have to be sensible and have a career and all these things. And these things just don't apply if you're an immortal, if you're a god. And, and then indeed you indulge yourself in all these uh, absurd seeming ways. But in some ways, I think these pantheons are uh, more attractive in, in showing this great diversity of experience than the monotheistic religions that try to sort all this out and say, no, 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 it's possible to be good forever. And then they try to portray it and you get, you know, uh, God sitting on his throne, having Hosanna sung to him for eternity. And, you know, if you uh, um, uh, do the right thing, you get to go and join him and sit there and 
sing hosannas for eternity and you just will really like it it just will be really amazing it, it might not sound it but it will be it just will be i, I was just going to say it seems to me like that's the only way that uh, living life forever um if it truly was forever would make sense is if we were to change our programming in some way so that we did find things interesting that generally we wouldn't find interesting so we'd have to lower our standards programmatically we'd have to alter the brain alter the programming of our brain so that we do uh, find uh, what we'd normally find bo boring not boring what we'd normally find um, producing on we not producing on we i completely agree the visions of forever that you know theologians and others try to conjure these aren't visions of of, of real humans you know it, it might be that some people can become one with the body of saints and sing hosannas to, to the Lord on his throne for eternity. But none of the people I know would like that. And uh, so I think that's the choice we're faced as finite beings. We have to embrace finitude. And if we want immortality, we'd have to become something else. Hosanna! <laughs> well, Stephen, this was <laughs> lots of fun. Um, really delightful conversation. And, you know, exploring one of life's deepest questions in... Uh, this dialogue has been really fantastic. So thank you so much.